uh, I'm Jonathan Bates, the creative director of Factory Media. Uh, here to kind of switch things up a little bit, not so much talking about tech, we're talking about an innovative uh, content model that we recently deployed um, over at Factory Media. Uh, we think it's really exciting. We think it's a new way of funding premium content that works across multiple platforms. We think it does a great job of uh, delivering brands, return on investments, and uh, we think it's a great way of, of, of funding this kind of this next generation of premium content. So I am the creative director at Factory Media. I've been at Factory Media for about a year and a half, and uh, one of the first projects I took on was, was this undertaking, The Indestructibles. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about that. It's an award-winning multi-platform TV and digital campaign. It was created in partnership with UK TV, Story Lab uh, being the agency, Casio G-Shock being the sponsor, and Factory Media who uh, produced it. Underpinning this model are a couple of kind of business drivers really. Producers really needing to find new and innovative ways of financing premium content. Brands wanting to move away from traditional advertising and move into more native ways of communicating and reaching audiences. And broadcasters needing to find ways of sourcing uh, premium television shows outside of the, the kind of classic way of just going out there and commissioning uh, programs with producers. Uh, so Avovis uh, is really all about content. Technology played a huge role in it. Uh, we use a lot of data and insights to kind of work out what our audiences wanted to see on digital platforms. And uh, this really is all about very smart uh, multi-platform distribution. It was, it was as much a digital campaign as it was a TV campaign. So uh, there was a lot of digital distribution that made this work and delivered that ROI to the brands. Over the next few minutes, I'll take you through the learnings that we found and discovered as a business and why we think it's such an exciting model. A uh, bit about me, I was previously the head of multi-platform video over at ITV, so very used to working with a linear proposition and trying to figure out how best to serve that on multiple platforms, whether that's just around program supports and kind of engaging audiences around programs, or whether it's working with commercial teams to find new and innovative ways of monetizing content on, uh, on multiple platforms. And before joining Factory Media, I was over at a tech startup called Rightster, and Rightster was all about a, uh, a one-stop solution for rights holders to upload your content once onto a single uh, platform and distribute and monetize it everywhere. So uh, coming from a kind of tech-ish background as well. So the Indestructibles, what was all that about? Well, here it is, two middle-aged blokes surfing on the 1989 Robin Reliance. Uh, who wouldn't want to watch that? Uh, eat that top here. Just a quick one before we go uh, any further on who Factory Media are, let's give you a little bit of context around our model. Uh, we're a media business. We own and operate 23 different websites and our kind of core proposition is around action sports. Uh, I used to call it extreme sports before I joined Factory Media, but apparently it's called action sports. That's what uh, the cool people call it. And we're talking about things like BMXing, skateboarding, surfing, outdoor adventure, all that kind of stuff. We're a company that's deeply connected with those sports. We're deeply connected with the talent that powers those sports, the athletes. Uh, we have a deep understanding of the cultural drivers behind those sports. You know, the way that a skateboarder sees the world is very different to how a surfer sees the world. They speak in different languages and we understand the nuances of those uh, sports. And uh, because of the type of content that we produce, those huge visuals, uh, very kind of inspirational content, uh, we've got quite a natural kind of gravity on, on digital platforms. It's the kind of content that people love to share, people love to talk about. It's, it's very kind of viral in, it, in, its, in its being. Um, we've all seen those big clips of you know, surfers surfing massive waves or wingsuit pilots sending themselves down mountains. It's all that kind of stuff that has a natural tendency to gain views. So on social media, uh, we, over the last three years in particular, we've, we've exploded in terms of our audience. We now reach around, I think it's about 380 million people every 30 days on social platforms. And as a business across all of our platforms, we have around 100 million views. So we already have a deep uh, and, uh, and very kind of tuned in audience on digital platforms. As, a, as an agency that makes branded content, we have to have a lot of services in-house, so we like to keep uh, things in-house where we can. We can deliver broadcasts, we've got production in-house, we've got talent management in-house, we can create experiential events. Uh, we've got a sales team that, that take care of our brand partnerships uh, and uh, are very good at kind of getting out there and, and, and selling, selling our wares. Um, the, one of the great things uh, about Factory Media is that uh, working in the world of action sports, we're in a kind of market segment that is really already tuned in to working with brands. If you think about uh, a lot of our sports, uh, they've kind of grown symbiotically with brands. Think about how Red Bull has integrated itself with the world of extreme sports. It's, it's very much a, a brand that has been there since the start. It's been nurturing grassroots athletes from kind of knee high to Olympic level athletes. It pumps a lot of money into events. Um, and as a result, it has a deep 
deep and meaningful relationship with those sports. Brands like GoPro as well, uh, you know, they, they kind of own that visual aspect of action sports, you know, that GoPro shot when you see it. And as a result, audiences are very used to seeing brands coexisting around our sports. So it never feels clunky, it never feels bolted on. Uh, the integration with our sports is, is quite deep and meaningful with brands. Uh, so why a new model? Looking at some of the fundamental drivers uh, behind this new model that we rolled out, we all know that content is very, very expensive to create. Great content is extremely expensive to create, and premium television, well, the sky is the limit in terms of, of the amount of money that it often takes to get this stuff financed. As a result, um, you know, premium content, very, very hard to, to get away, and producers more and more so are looking to brands and looking for alternative funding models to make this content work. Um, but of course, if you're working in that branded world, critically, you have to be able to deliver your clients a solid return on investment. And often that means having to think outside of single platforms and thinking about how you push that out to massive audiences in order to have any chance of, uh, of uh, delivering your brand an ROI. So we've been working on that for a while. Uh, just a little timeline on Factory Media. We started out as a print business around 15 years ago. Uh, and we've gone through uh, a huge change ever since those days. Uh, it was all about printing uh, way back when. Then we launched websites that support our magazines. And as kind of, you know, broadband took off, people consuming more multimedia-focused content online, video became a big thing for us. And as our video became more premium, we were able to kind of move with those changing times with brands wanting to move kind of beyond traditional advertising and integrate themselves into our video content. So we've been doing branded content for an awful long time. And as social media exploded, and as we started seeing those massive numbers on social platforms, uh, mixing that with our ability to create content has become a very powerful proposition. And then at the start of 2015, we took that brave decision as a publisher to turn off the printing presses. So all the 23 magazines that were being printed, uh, we decided instead of uh, kind of managing a declining business in the world of print, to refocus our resource on the area of growth, which was, which was digital. So it was a brave move, uh, and, and ultimately one that has allowed us to really focus as a business. And as I was saying, you know, uh, there's, there's a huge kind of market driver in, in, in that decision-making process. If you're moving into the world of branded content, Having those roots in the world of action sports where brand and content is nothing new uh, put us already at a kind of a head start, if you like. A lot of our clients, a lot of our go-to brands are already very used to working in our sports. And uh, even as far back as the early 1980s, uh, we saw brands doing branded content. So branded content in our world is, is really nothing new. So why this new model then? Well, brands are used to working with us, they're used to working in our sports. Uh, collectively, they want to reach our audiences in an authentic way. Uh, we want to produce premium content and we need new funding models to help us do that. So we developed the Indestructibles. And uh, the Indestructibles is a true multi-platform content piece. As I said, it was produced by Factory Media. We gained sponsorship by, uh, from Casio G-Shock, uh, supported by Story Labs and Aegis, aired across uh, UK TV's Dave channel and uh, atomized and distributed out to Factory Media's 23 websites and, of course, our social feeds as well. On one, ha one side of the coin, it is a 12 times 30-minute television series. On the other side, it's a digital campaign made up of over 300 pieces of content. So really, it's a classic example of how you make digital and television work together in order to deliver uh, value to your, to your brand. Uh, it's got a great story behind it. It presents a series of action sports-focused challenges, but we knew from right from the start we needed to make this as much about entertainment as it was our sports. This, after all, was going to go out there into the brave new world of mass audiences, and uh, therefore we knew it needed to be uh, entertaining to, to people that don't necessarily jump on skateboards on the weekend. It's got all the usual kind of uh, recipes for engagement. It's got jeopardy in it. It's got comedy, excitement, science, and danger. Uh, if I was to kind of wrap it up into a single sentence, I'd say it's kind of Top Gear meets Mythbusters or something like that. It's designed from the ground up with both long form in mind and a clear kind of direction on how we can chop this up and turn it into short form as well for digital contents. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's also got a, a, a big brand focus and a broadcaster focus as well. So to save me kind of mumbling around how the new model works, I'd love to show you a quick video uh, that uh, encapsulates how we put this together from beginning to end. It looks at things from a kind of brand perspective, which isn't always the best way of looking at it, but this is about how you drive value uh, to, con uh, to, to your spending content if you're a brand, but there's multiple ways of looking at this. One of the classic problems with old school AFP uh, or advertiser-funded programming on television is that if for any reason your, your show on TV doesn't perform as expected if you don't hit your slot average or if something happens at the broadcast and you don't quite get the slot you want, uh, your ROI as a brand ends up in complete tatters because you haven't performed. But what we were able to do fundamentally is, uh, is shore up that audience digitally 
And uh, ooh, that's gone too far. Show up that audience digitally and guarantee our brand scale on digital platforms. If they knew the amount of money they were spending, it was going to justify itself just through the digital distribution with the, with the TV stuff being the kind of nice to have on top. So it is a, a new and innovative way of looking at that world of advertiser-funded programming. Uh, we were in a kind of unique position to do that because we had relationships with the brands, we had relationships with the agency, we had the relationships with the broadcaster, and I'll go into how we worked with the broadcaster to make that happen. And uh, we kept the content production and the distribution in-house, so we knew that we could get scale to this, we knew we could make it happen and bring all those parties together. But we still used a lot of data and insights before we went into this. Although we have a deep understanding of our audiences and we know the kind of content that uh, they like to consume, we still wanted to make sure that uh, what we were doing and the content we were going to deliver to our audiences was going to gain the scale that we needed. So we turned to data and research to make sure that that was all good after all we needed to deliver that ROI. So we commissioned some research with the Insights Distillery. We wanted to gauge the audience appetite for this type of content. We picked out five key areas off the back of that research that we knew uh, our audience expected to see from this content. We knew that was going to drive the engagement. Uh, first of all, the content had to be inspirational, so it had to be the kind of stuff that you'd find yourself watching, whether it's on your mobile or your tablet or your laptop or on TV, and just saying to yourself, God, those guys look like they're having fun. I kind of want to be out there doing that stuff. Uh, we, knew, we know that the, the content that gets the most shares and the most engagement online is highly visual, so it's all about those big wow moments, so those big stunts we were pulling off had to look visually spectacular. Uh, we know that celebrity is important as well, so we cast uh, two presenters who are known to the Dave channel. Uh, they were already presenting Red Bull content for UK TV. And, uh, and uh, we also knew that we had to make the, the brand integration feel authentic. We didn't want to do the classic kind of dad at the disco kind of brand masquerading as cool content, but actually it's all just rather embarrassing. This was about making sure that the brand integration felt genuine. Uh, and once we knew we had Casio uh, on board as a sponsor and it was all about their G-Shock watches, we went back to the format and we baked in a time pressure. Uh, we gave our presenters three days to pull off the stunt, which meant we could legis legitimize uh, the occasional watch shot as they kind of glanced to check how much time they've got left. And it's a race against the clock as they try to pull off these big stunts. Just in terms of how we set about delivering this stuff, unlike traditional AFP, as I said earlier, we started with the idea. It was all about uh, a great content proposition, and it was all about getting the right broadcaster to buy into it. If, fundamentally, if your broadcaster is just running this for commercial reasons, uh, chances are it's not going to get the best slot. They might bury it on the graveyard shift. So we went in at very early stages before we even knew what kind of brand we had on this, and we excited the commissioning teams and the editorial teams at the broadcasters, uh, made sure that we developed it with them, so that it was a, a series that they genuinely wanted to run. And as a result of doing that, uh, we were able to secure a, uh, a shoulder peak slot. We went out on Sunday evenings at 5.30. So, so working with them to make sure they were happy with the content was really important. We then took the proposition back internally into the four walls of factory media and worked very closely with our audience development teams and our digital teams to make sure that the way we were going to chop this content up digitally would, would definitely serve our audience best and definitely drive that million views that we promised to, to Casio. And, and we did a pretty good job. We ended up with over 7 million views. And, um, and, and as I said, finally, we, we, once we uh, had, had all of that value wrapped up, once we knew what the value of the airtime was, and once we knew what the value of a digital dis distribution would be, uh, we then took that out to the media agencies who were able to bring us back briefs uh, from brands that were interested in getting involved. We had a couple that we had to turn down because we couldn't produce the content in time, but in the end, we, we ended up with uh, a brief from Casio G-Shop. <laughs> That wasn't me. Casio G-Shock, who wanted to, who wanted to go out ahead of Christmas, they wanted to be in the November and December slot as they went up against the Apple Watch, and their whole raison d'etre was telling the world that actually, you know, uh, we're a tough watch that you can get out there and, and do these kind of sports wearing and it, it won't break on you. So hence even the reason for the indestructibles, it was all about that kind of tough indestructible uh, emotion. Uh, and again, you know, thinking about how best to, to do this stuff when you're dealing with multiple platforms, it's not just about turning up and suddenly exploding loads of content. We have to be uh, very careful with how we phase the distribution of that content. As I said, there was 300 pieces of digital content. So getting the timing right so we knew we were genuinely engaging and building an audience all the time before we went on television was really important. And in fact, we spanned the clock back three months before our first transmission. That's when we started uh, engaging our audience with uh, sh super short form clips that we were licensing 
from you know kind of partners like Jukin, Viral Spiral, uh, Red Bull, Media House. Uh, these were just clips we were licensing of athletes doing incredible things. We were badging those up and drip feeding those out to our social platforms. And that was really driving the curve in the audience as the audiences started to get behind the show, started to understand what it was. And the second thing that was doing was also driving a lot of data and insight back into the production. So if we put a clip up, you know, two months before we went on air, we would still, in, still be in production. If for any reason that clip exploded and started doing you know, millions of views, we could, we could very quickly start to, start to create a case to putting that clip and that moment in the show itself because clearly it was something audiences were, were really engaging with. We then move into what we call a build phase, which is two weeks before we transmit, and that's where we start uh, teasing out sneak peeks from the show, uh, whether that's extra edits from the actual set, uh, behind the scenes uh, clips and interviews and teasers and all that kind of stuff, with a very definitive call to action uh, telling people to, to, to watch on Dave, so it's got a, uh, an appointment to view call to action in it. And then finally, we have what we call our spike section, which is where engagement's at an all-time peak. We've just transmitted on air. Uh, that big hero moment's gone out, the big stunt that we've just pulled off, and that's where we have our social teams uh, take that moment and then distribute that out to multiple platforms almost the, the second it happens so audiences can watch it again, they can engage with it again and, and share it with their friends. Fundamentally on this, we wanted to create a model where everybody wins, all of the various stakeholders involved in, in, in the content, so the brand, the broadcaster, factory media, and our audience. You can kind of start the conversation from anywhere in that, that circle of love. Uh, it, in our particular case, it started with an idea from us. We knew we wanted to create this content, but we needed a way to fund it. So uh, we went to the broadcaster. We said, look, you can have a free program. We will make this for you for nothing, which is a big tick in the box for the broadcaster. Um, and, and then we were able to, to wrap that up and take that to our brand, who, of course, were able to get behind a premium piece of content that was built from the ground up with the brand in mind. Uh, it was de-risked in terms of ROI because we were able to put it out on TV, but also guaranteed a return on investment on digital platforms. Uh, for factory media, the big part of the reason why we do this is because we hold on to the international rights, and that's critical to this whole model. It means that we can take the investment that the brand puts into this content and we can put as much of that money on screen as we possibly can, because it, we're not in the game of trying to take big margins out of this uh, from the initial brand spend. For us, uh, we're all about generating valuable rights. So we were able to put all of that brand's money on screen. And for factory media, that's why we have distribution in-house, because we then take those, those rights, and currently uh, we're doing that now. We're selling the indestructibles all around the world to broadcasters who are lapping it up. Um, and for our audience, again, you know, we're, we're very uh, protective of our, of our audience. We always want to make content that works for those guys too. Uh, so we, used, we, asked, we asked our audience what they wanted to see. We used data, we used insights. And uh, when we created a multi-platform program for our, our audiences to enjoy, uh, no matter how they wish to consume it, whether it's on television, whether it's on uh, multiple platforms. So what did we learn about the whole thing? So uh, for us, uh, we, we always think content first. It's all about great content, uh, regardless of the platform. It's all about understanding your audiences. It's all about hearing what your audiences want and making sure you service in the right way to them. Uh, critically for us, uh, it's about thinking beyond the four walls of your platform. So we have a dot-com business. We have our own uh, sites and our own platforms. Uh, but we fundamentally understand that you have to let your content break out from those four walls if it's to be successful. And that's why we're thinking about the scale that we can get on broadcast. And we're thinking about the scale we can deliver on social platforms. And we're thinking about the scale we can deliver by working with other publishers and other partners to, to uh, syndicate our content to. And finally, I think it's about thinking beyond the, beyond the uh, traditional models in terms of how you fund content. Uh, it's highly fragmented at the moment, so we don't tr tend to think, you know, can we just get a brand to pay for this? Can we just, you know, make this work in terms of CPM-based pre-roll on our video content? Can we just get a broadcaster to pay for it? We're always thinking about all of those different funding options and quite often trying to cherry pick little bits, you know, what money can we get from a broadcaster? What money can we take out of pre-sales in the international market? What money can we get from a brand? What money can we get around uh, amplifying that and extending that on digital platforms? And it's by putting that fragmented world back together we are able to fund premium content for our audiences, which hasn't been easy, but it's, it's, been a, it's been an enjoyable ride, and we think we've got a new model that we would love to uh, be doing more of. Thank you very much. It was awesome. I've still got the scars to prove it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Being on set with those guys, yeah. Just digging into, into the business model a bit more, and you're talking about the circle of love. Um, yes. Who owns Indestructibles? Factory Media owns okay. Indestructibles uh, internationally, uh, and the broadcaster retains the rights in the UK right. for okay. five years. Okay. 
and G-Shock pay a fee to you as a sort of customer publisher to produce it? Yeah, it's a proper brand partnership. So, so G-Shock uh, are, are, are putting money into the format in order to, to get product placement and in order to get the bumpers uh, on, on the ad breaks of, of that content on television and bumpers also top and tailing all the digital content as well. Okay. So and as you sort of hinted, the circle of love will op vary from project to project. Yes, uh, as, absolutely. As, as not who, who you can fleece the money from, but, but who... Yeah. Who joins you in, in the Abs Absolutely. And it could be funded by multiple partners in that. So it could be that Factory Media invests some of the money into the production. It could be that the broadcaster puts some of the money into the production. It could be that a brand puts some of the money into the production. In this case, in the, in the case of the Indestructibles, it was, it was mainly the brand, but Factory Media also put some kind of skin in the game as well to, to activate it and make it happen. Uh, and as I said, our, our end game was holding on to international rights so that... Uh, we would monetize it in the next kind of five years on the international market.